Welcome to the Creation Science Hour. This is Kent Hovind in Pensacola, Florida, sitting next to my son, Eric. Good and, afternoon. And this is December 11th. If you're listening to this program live on the Internet on truthradio.com, we're here. We are. If you're watching this on tape, it's probably a different date. Yeah. <laughs> probably, it's probably not December 11th. Don't 2003. call. Don't call. Well, you can still call, but we may not be there. Anyway, uh, we always state our position, what we believe, and what we're trying to accomplish here. We believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. We think the evolution theory that's being taught in our school system is one of the dumbest and most dangerous ideas in the history of the world. And Satan is laughing at you for believing his lie that you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, and we're here to help. That's what we're here for. We don't want you to be laughed at for all eternity. We want you to get it straight now while you're still living. So what we've decided to do is dedicate these next few programs to um, some of the anti-Hovind websites. If you, t- if you type in Kent Hovind on the Internet, your computer will melt because there are nearly a thousand anti-Hovan sites. People just don't like me, and I don't know why. You've known me a long time, son. I've told everybody that I've ever met that I am the nicest guy I've ever met. And you they, are. I am. You're yeah. a pretty nice guy. Right. And uh, my kids are all married and all live uh, near me and all work for me, actually. And we have a wonderful relationship, so we appreciate uh, you being with us, son. Yesterday on the program, we got partway through the uh, website called uh, geocities.com slash Ken Hovind. If you type in Kent Hovind, H-O-V-I-N-D, up will come on the screen a whole list of nearly a thousand websites, most of them anti-Hovind websites. The first one that comes up is our website, because, you know, my name's in there quite a bit, apparently. Second thing that comes up is this one by a guy named Carl Mary Church in Australia. We did contact Carl Mary Church, though we're under no obligation to do so. I mean, he's had a public website of anti-Hovind for years up there, so uh, Jonathan's been emailing him back and forth, and he complained today that, you know, you didn't tell him this was a, a debate with Carl Mary Church. Well, it's not a debate. I'm simply responding to his website saying, look, you're accusing me of things that are simply not true, and you promised in your correspondence to correct the site. So we're going to take up where we left off. If you want to join us, get on the Internet and go to... uh, They can't get on two Internet sites at once, can they, Jonathan? Yeah. TruthRadio.com, if you're listening right now, if you'd like to join later, if you're watching the broadcast, uh, or if you'd like to call in, we're going to be taking calls the second half of the show. First of all, we're going to go through and and, uh, discuss some more of these things that Carl brings up in his website. Uh, The toll-free number to call, just so you know, you can write it down, is 877-479-3466, which spells out DINO. And that only works in the U.S.? In the the continental U.S. 850. 479 dino will get you from anywhere in the world. And you have to pay for that phone call. Sorry about that. And you got to do some kind of country code 011-479-329-846, whatever you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> Figure it out. Do it. Give us a call. We'd be glad to take your call. If you have AOL, you might want to join us. Uh, our screen name is Dr. Dino Live. Dr. Dino Live, if you'd like to join us on AOL. And instant message your questions uh, or comments in. We'll get those. And if it has to do with the show, we'll probably get a hold of it and talk about it. Sounds great. Okay, we're going to take off where we left off. We're on uh, what amounted to the third line. When you go to his homepage at uh, 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 Carl Mary Church's, actually you type in um, geocities.com and <clears throat> slash Ken Hovind. The third, we went through the introduction. Uh, we're talking about my quarter million dollar offer, which has been available for uh, 10 or 12 years. Started off at 1000 bucks 15 years ago, and now it's up to a quarter million. Okay, we want some evidence for evolution. He's complaining about my offer. So we're on line three, which starts off... Uh, Created the life that exists in a, uh, at least one of those planets from non-living matter, which was my statement. That's about yeah. halfway, or about a quarter of the way down the page, if you're checking it out yeah. for yourself. His response was, while present knowledge of molecular biology has not solved this riddle, it is interesting. Hoven said the following on the issue of accepting such a discovery as evidence for evolution. And he's, he's quoting something I said at a university. Um, and I said, uh, I was at a university to speak speak to a group of hostile students who all believed in evolution. One of the students said, what would you say if they could make life in the laboratory? How about that? What would you say then? I said, well, that would prove that it takes intelligence to create life, wouldn't it? It would take a lot of design and intelligence. I'm not going to say they're not ever going to be able to do it, but if they did, it certainly would not prove evolution. It would prove creation. Well, Carl, precisely the point, okay? It would take intelligence to make life. That's how they missed that. And he says here, well, molecular biology has not solved the riddle. In other words, we don't know how life got started. Okay, well, the Carl, this is my whole point. Until you can prove scientifically that it happened without a designer, quit teaching the kids that it did happen without a designer. Exactly. 
don't call it part of science. Don't include it in a science book. It's not part of science. It's a religion. It's something you believe happened. You hope it happened. You pray it happened. Well, you probably don't pray it happened, but you know, uh, <laughs> you it isn't, it until then, it's not science. That's the point we're trying to get across, and uh, some people don't get it. Another whole point is I don't believe science really has determined what life is. You can't take something that is that should be living and and put life into that. We can't breathe the breath of life into anything. Or you can't take a, a frog and put it in a blender and blend it up, and you have all the molecules for a frog in one spot. Now, you know, make, make it come alive. Put it together. That's, uh, that's a bad picture in my mind. Wow. Wow, frog nog. That's yeah. <laughs> Christmas coming up, okay? That's true. Red okay, and blue. okay uh, number five, or number four. I said in my website, uh, cause the living creatures to be capable of, in, capable of and interested in reproducing themselves. And he writes, this is a straw man. Uh, it's almost tautolog- tautologically obvious that organisms that wouldn't reproduce would not survive, and those that do reproduce will survive. An organism that doesn't reproduce is, by very definition, non-living. Well, this is not correct, okay? The definition, uh, there are many organisms that do not reproduce, that cannot reproduce for whatever reason. They certainly are alive. I've met people that don't have any children, would like to, can't have any children, they're still alive. Yeah. So you're wrong about that, Carl. I'd change that sentence. Definitely need to take that out. Uh, second half hour, we're going to take calls, or listen, well, is it about this? Okay, it, it we can take one here, but most of the second, no, say the rest of the second half hour. We've got a bunch to cover here. Okay. Who? Josh. Okay, Josh, go ahead. How do you? Hello, I can barely hear you, Josh. I'm, I'm getting a really intense ringing sound. Very, very difficult to hear. I'm getting a ringing sound, too. Now, we have a whole lot of equipment set up here, and three guys over here working on it. And according to evolution, complex things like this happen automatically. Uh, I lost the ringing sound, but I don't hear Josh anymore, either. I'm not here. Okay, go ahead, Josh. Okay, I'm not hearing that. The idea that the scripture is what? It's composed of ancient Eastern mythology. And What's the, the, the actual not. question, I, the actual question I have, I don't, I don't agree with it at all. However, I'm thinking of course for the ancient Eastern mythology. One of the things that's been fascinating to me is you've got several shows like Watch It and In Person, supposedly the enemy of the characters of the history of life and so on and so forth. My question is when, you know, if, if, if no one is failing with a World. At one point, when they were passing on the trail of Adam and Eve, was it have gotten to the point where we have the Egyptians actually coming up with these ideas, with these tales that were semi-perverted, or entirely perverted, actually, the creation tale itself? Okay, well, let me give you a quick history of that. Um, Moses edited the book of Genesis. He didn't actually write the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis was written by ten different authors, all of them eyewitnesses. Uh, the phrase... Uh, these are the generations of is the break point in Genesis where it breaks it up. You can tell who wrote the book. Um, for instance, Genesis uh, 2 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 5 1 says, These are the generations of Adam. Genesis 6 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. That's the break point. And the person is signing off and apparently probably writing this on clay tablets, we would assume, baking them in the sun, and then handing it to the next generation who's going to carry on the tradition of keeping track of the, the, the holy records. Moses put them all together in the book of Genesis. Now, the truth of the matter is, Moses lived uh, a long time after the flood, I think about a thousand years after the flood. By then, a few other cultures had already written down their oral traditions of the flood. The Babylonians, the Sumerians, a couple others had already written down their oral tradition. The fact that they wrote it down first doesn't mean they have the right story or that it's accurate. They just were the first ones to put it on paper. And there are some serious perversions in there. But there are also some very obvious seeds of truth because you can see it rings true with Genesis. Uh, that there was a time when people lived to be nearly a thousand. That's in the ancient uh, stories. There was a worldwide flood. That's in hundreds and hundreds of ancient stories. So I think uh, some people confuse it and they say, well, Moses must have copied from the Babylonians because the Babylonians wrote it down first. No, Moses had the original tablets. He had the actual story. The other ones had you know, many generations old legend that they were writing down. They didn't have the actual story. So it's obvious theirs would be perverted and Moses would be correct. Another um, important thing to note is that... Uh, the people, the length that they were living at that time, obviously after the flood, their, their, length span, their lifespans dropped off suddenly and, and greatly. However, before the flood, they were living to be uh, over 900 years right. old. Therefore, the story isn't passed just to the next generation. Adam shared the story of creation with Noah's father, right. Lamech. Lamech you know? knew Adam for 56 years. So. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, the, there would be much less perversion back then when they were living longer. Yeah, obviously. You got eight or ten of your ancestors, you know, your grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, all of them living, they can all cooperate the story. And then, of course, Methuselah's life overlaps these guys. If you look at the chart at the back of our seminar notebook, Jonathan, is that chart on our online on our website? That, uh, 
Uh, yeah. Go to our website, Dr. Dino, and it's... Uh, look, look up longevity charts. Longevity I should be on there somewhere. Yeah. Longevity chart. That'll help you see. <clears throat> and of course, then Methuselah lived, obviously, long enough, long time with Adam, and a long time with Noah. He would have been a good uh, guy, uh, intermediate between the two. And then Noah and Shem lived a long time after the flood. Shem probably could have known Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, very easily. There's a little controversy the, uh, about how old Abraham, or uh, how old Terah was when Abraham was born. We cover that on our website also. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. All right, you, you can call it. Um, okay, let's get back to the uh, uh, topic here of uh, the Antihoven websites. We're going to try to cover this. Uh, and any uh, editors of these sites, which we're going to go through slowly here over the next 400 years, are welcome to call in and defend their position if I'm wrong. So what uh, Mary Church is saying here on his site, uh, geocities.com slash Canthoven, is saying that uh, organisms that don't reproduce would not survive. Well, well he's no, missing, he's missing the, the point of my question. Radio. The question was, uh, this evolution theory is supposed, supposedly Hello. what's responsible for causing Hello. people, causing creatures to be capable of and Hello. interested in reproducing themselves. Well, that is a very, very complex you, yeah, hi, system. Is complex. The uh, chances of it evolving are zero. Uh, no, uh, quietly. The no, no, not, uh, not, uh, uh, capable uh, of reproduction is a major big obstacle big evolution set up. Interested in is another one. Kind of, uh, Why would any animal want to reproduce more of its own kind okay, let me see if that's only going to create more mouths to feed? Yeah. Why did none of the animals evolve the ability to live forever? That would have been smarter. That would have been a great one. Yeah. <laughs> you get the whole world to yourself, all the food you want, you live forever. Why would they be? Why would they want to produce more of their own kind to just increase competition? Duh. No. Evolution has no answer to that other than, you know, I can say the scripture says that's how God designed it. And I believe that's true. That's my religion. I quickly admit that's my religion. The problem is the evolutionists don't admit theirs is a That's theirs, exactly. We dealt with that yesterday on the program. A lady, uh, Pamela, called in. And uh, it's very difficult to see that evolution really is a religious belief. You must believe in it. You can't know it as right. fact. And I, I'm convinced Satan's laughing at these people for believing his dumb idea. But hey, yeah. it's working. You know, He's loving it. Christ. Yeah. Okay, number five on the website. Uh, uh, I said in my on my uh, quarter million dollar offer that uh, the evolution theory caused that first life form to spontaneously diversify into different forms of living things, such as plants and animals on the earth today, biological evolution. His response is, this is a straw man. Whenever there is replication of DNA, there are errors. Sex sexual reproduction also adds further combinations of variety. And it also... It is upon this variations in populations that natural selection operates. This process is elegantly simple. He is still talking about microevolution here. Yeah, he's not getting it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, the theory says that complex life forms came from simpler life forms. There is no evidence of that. Right. There are people who believe in that. Well, great. You can believe whatever you want, but quit calling it science. Okay. Exactly. What we see is dogs produce dogs. You know, roses produce roses. Farmers plant corn. They expect to get. Corn. corn. <laughs> and so far, that's all that's happened really before they get nothing. Maybe nothing. Neither nothing grows or corn grows, that's for sure. Okay, he says, this is a straw man. I think you're wrong, Carl. I take this section out of your uh, out of your website. He said, uh, what Hoven is playing here with is the macro-micro loophole. In a footnote, Hoven states, when I use the word evolution, I'm not referring to minor variations. I don't want to read the whole thing. You can read that on the website yourself. Let me get his... Uh, but he's still he's trying to say that uh, micro and macroevolution are basically the same thing. It's just macroevolution is microevolution over a longer period of time is really what he's trying to come across with. He's saying, look, right. you, you can't divide these. They're the same thing. And we're saying we never see the macro. All we ever see right. is the micro. They're That's, definitely different. They just don't get it. They assume and they hope and they think that micro would lead to macro, which is fine. Uh, Carl, you can believe that all you want. I don't care what you believe. But you just stepped outside of science and went to religion and didn't even see that you did that. Yeah. And that's the hard thing to see. And yeah. when, when we, if we were to discuss it on the phone, Carl, if you were to call in, we'd be happy to discuss this with you. It's very easy to show microevolution. We can show that all day long. There's sure. lots of evidence. But as soon as it goes to macroevolution, that's where you will never, ever be able to give evidence. No, they, they can believe it. And he says, Lenny Frank has written a short essay on the issues of kinds and the use of the term by creationists. The Bible uses the word kind, yeah. and it's very simple. If you want to tell if it's the same kind, can it bring forth? It doesn't even have to bring forth an organism that will reproduce later. The horse and the zebra can bring forth a zorse. Uh, the horse and the ass can bring forth a mule. Now, generally, the mule is sterile. Jonathan, were you on the phone with me talking to the guy who had the, the, the mule? Blue Moon was the name of the mule. We talked to the guy. His mule was fertile. And Interesting. Had two of them. Yeah, had ended up with a brother later. The guy's still alive. He's like 80 years old. Where was he? Was that in Virginia? Yeah. Wow. 
Occasionally, a mule is is uh, is fertile. Okay, but it, it still doesn't matter. Even if the animal, even if the offspring is always sterile, the fact that the horse and the ass can cross proves they are originally the same kind because yeah. they those two did bring forth. I mean, you stand back and look at it; it looks basically like the same kind of animal. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery. They got it all. All the standard equipment. Okay, it's a <laughs> horse, obviously. Now, by the same token, I would say the horse and the pine tree cannot right. reproduce. I would say those are definitely a different. Yeah. Now, see, I, that's why I said many times, generally, a five-year-old can tell you where the line is. You know. yeah. Give a five-year-old a hundred different animals and say, which one of these are the same kind? Now, most evolutionists like to use the word species instead of kind. Right. That was is there a good definition of species? No. A dog and a wolf are different species. However, they're infertile. They're infertile. They can still produce. Pretty much every definition of species they've come up with has fallen through, hasn't it? Right. And you, they, can, you, can yeah. find a, uh, you can find a... So it's, it's a straw man argument. They're yeah. making up a term species and then claiming that uh, they well, we can see we can create a new species. Well, I'm not arguing species. Well, we're saying it's the same kind of it's animal. The same kind of animal, yeah. right? So that's another. Uh, if you're listening when in, and you're discussing evolution with somebody, um, that's another tactic that they like to use. You know, look, we created a brand new species here, and they like to use that word when actually, if you really get down to it, you stand back and look at it, it's the same kind. They talk about these bacteria that are that are um, changing. And adapting to the environment, and they call it a new species of bacteria. Stand back and look at it. What is it? It's, it's a bacteria. It's still a bacteria and has a loss of information, not a yeah. gain. We get into that a little bit on video. Yeah. yeah. Let me skip a few paragraphs here. I don't want to read this whole thing and take 600 years on just this one website, because there are thousands of websites, or maybe hundreds of websites to go. I've skipped down to where uh, it says in red print on his website, what Hoven is not telling you about the, uh, uh, the offer here. Number one, it says, Hovind does not have the quarter million prize money. He claims a rich friend does. Okay, Carl, this is correct. A rich friend of mine we does. Don't. No. We don't. But he does. Uh, he does. He does. The rich friend, the yeah. offer he is does. fine. So why would you have something like this in here? I don't. I, and I've said very clearly many times that this offer is uh, sponsored by somebody else. Yeah. So there's not, this is unnecessary for you to take up valuable internet space with this <laughs> uh, trivial bit of information. Okay. Secondly, it says the committee remains anonymous. Even a selected challenger is not allowed to know their identities. Let me tell you why, Carl, okay? The first couple times, I had, I think, two people wrote in and gave me their evidence for evolution, which was dumb stuff. But I said, okay, I'll give it to the committee. I sent a copy to each, I sent a letter to each of the people on the committee and to the person who sent the information in. And I sent him all of their names and addresses and said they will respond to you. He spent the next year filling their mailbox yeah. and email box with pornography and with uh, all kinds of... Uh, uh, evil email, and so I wrote them all. Over. I said, "Fellas, I apologize. We well, won't do that again. I will send you the information, and you can respond and give them your in contact information if you'd like to." Yeah. These are busy men. These are trained scientists. I don't even know if they're creationists. All I know is they're experts in their field. So I sent them the information, and if if you have some legitimate information on evolution, we want to see it, and we will send it to them. Just sure. uh, just a couple. What was it? A week ago? Two last weeks week, ago? Yeah. Last week, we uh, a gentleman sent in. It was. Kind of ridiculous information, but hey, we're keeping to our word. We're sending it to the panel, and uh, we're going to see what they say without any biased opinion. Right. And uh, have they have they said anything yet on it? Are they well, commenting on it? I wrote them a letter. I wrote the the guy who sent the information in the, the you know request for the quarter million, and I said I suspect these guys are going to ignore you because they're not going to think you're serious because what you sent in is basically dumb. Okay, <laughs> I didn't say it that way, but it was basically dumb. It's always dumb. One guy, I was in Indiana one time. He came to the meeting. And he said, "I've got proof for evolution. I want your quarter million dollars." I said, oh, I don't have it with me, but uh, what's your proof? He said, I'm working in the laboratory right now, and we've developed soybean plants that are resistant to frost. Totally wow. new species. Wow. I said, man, that'll be handy. I mean, farmers need that. Some yeah. places, they need that, you know. I said, what'd you start with? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, did you start with nothing? Oh, no. Did you start with dirt? No. Started with soybean plants. Oh. And what do you have now? What do you got now? He said, a whole new species. Of what? Of what? <laughs> Soybean plants. <laughs> so it's all right. You better go reread the offer. You don't okay. get it, pal. <laughs> so should I bother sending that to these you know, people, these people on the committee that have uh, lots of other things to do besides handle dumb questions like that? No, I think that's answered very simply in, in our simple seminar series that fourth graders can understand. Yeah, yeah. Fourth graders are going to tell you, no, that's a simple variation. That's not evolution. Sorry, okay. pal. Carl goes on and says, the committee is selected by Kent Hovind himself. Well, what would you like, Carl? Would you like to select the committee? Uh, think about it, okay? Uh, all right, we'll take a break, folks. Join us after the break. Welcome back, folks, to the Creation Science Hour. This is segment number two of uh, our three. Three. Total, three yes. Total. Okay. Of Dr. Hoven Answers His Critics. Here we go. Answering the critics that uh, are out there 
trying to bash Kent Hovind any possible way. Here's the answers you've been looking for. Right. It's good to have my son, Eric, with me. He's been out speaking on creation four and a half years and only got one debate. So maybe some of you folks are a little afraid to debate, you know, me? You big wig. You can debate. You can take you can on debate. the little guy. Take on the little guy. I think he can handle it just fine. <laughs> Here in about okay. 10 minutes, by the way, we're going to take take calls. Uh, we'd like the calls to be related to uh, Dr. Hoven's critics and some other criticisms that you might have uh, might wonder about about Dr. Hoven. Uh, to call, just feel free to call it our toll-free number in the continental United States, which is 877-479-3466. 877-479-3466. If you have AOL Instant Messaging... You can use our screen name, Dr. Dr. Dino Dino Live, and check it out and uh, instant message us, Dr. Dino Live, D-R-D-I-N-O Live. I'm sitting here right now. Okay, at the rate we're going, it's going to take a thousand years to get through just this one website, so we're going to skip a few things. If some some of the stuff we skip bothers you, feel free to call in and uh, mention on the program. I have have nothing to hide that I know of. I mean, well, I wear clothes, but uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, teach the truth. I think what we've done for years is, is just exactly that. Okay, we're analyzing the website, The Analysis of Kent Hovind, by Carl Mary Church from Australia, and it's uh, geocities.com slash Kent Hovind, if you type in on the internet. I'd like to point out that so far, nothing's held up, has it? Not in my opinion. Uh, I'm sure in his it has. I'm sure he's thinking, right. oh, these, he opens wrong on all the stuff he said. You know, he's lying, I'm right. Oh, great. Anyway, he gives some evidence about the committee. We're going to skip a few things here for sake of time. But I'm on the third section of his site, which was called uh, the quarter million dollar offer. All right. Um, I mention in mine, if you're convinced that evolution is an indisputable fact, may I suggest you offer a quarter million dollars for any empirical histor- or historical evidence against the general theory of evolution. This might include the following, and I go through and give a bunch here. Number one, that the Earth is not billions of years old. And he says, for the demolition of every young Earth proof, Kent Hovind has suggested. See, you know, this, this website. Uh, referring to, I forget the guy's name now, that has uh, Dave, Dave Madsen, who has how good are Kent Hovind's young Earth proofs. We'll get into that later. It probably 20 programs from now, but uh, I still am willing to defend myself on any of those issues, and we can here. So, no, <clears throat> I think it's pretty obvious uh, to the trained scientific eye that the Earth cannot be billions of years old for lots of scientific reasons. And uh, he says, uh, number two, no, it's a straw man, no definition of kind has ever been given by Hovind. Uh, Carl, you're simply mistaken or you're lying. I've given yeah. it many times. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Exactly. Or would it, is it better to say the original animals that were able to bring forth? Right. I think they like might, the they Alaska might diver- rabbits and the Florida rabbits can't can't bring forth. Right. They can. You can diversify to the point like branches on a tree. Evolution is trying to make it like it's one big tree. No, it's an orchard. Yeah. There's a horse kind. There's a dog kind, which has produced hundreds of varieties of branches on the dog exactly. tree. You know, it's an orchard. There's a bunch of different mm-hmm. kinds of animals God created. Okay. Um, let's see. No one has observed. Life arising spontaneously from non-living matter. He says, this is true depending on the definition of life used. Well, Carl, I'm glad you partially agree with me on something. That's good. Okay. Uh, Matter cannot make itself out of nothing. See the professor. I haven't looked at that website here. Not only that, but backing up to contradiction, Hovind has admitted he does not know what a kind is. Uh, Even if you have said that in the past, I'd say we would retract that, even if that was said. I think maybe in a debate, somebody uh, asked the question. I could go back and look at one of the debates, but I said, I I may not know exactly what the original kinds are. And he probably took that as, well, you don't know what a kind is. Well, the Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Okay. Uh, Is that the end of this section? Um, His suggestion. Okay, after my five things, uh, when I use the word evolution, I give the five different definitions. And he says uh, the five types of evolution that don't happen. He says, Hovind has implied the above events did not occur simply because, sim- but simply with the aid of God. In short, he has just presented the case for theistic evolution, which Hovind does not support. No. You're missing the point <laughs> totally here, Carl. Okay, I'm saying these five things cannot happen by themselves. God, however, did bring everything into existence. This is not theistic evolution. I'm not saying that God used some kind of process to let the creatures evolve. That would be a retarded God. That would be a cruel God. There's a joke going around that God spoke and bang, it happened. We're not saying God used the Big Bang there. Not at all. Okay, and he gives a bunch of links of people who've tried to take up my uh, my challenge, and uh, I I will be glad to debate any of these guys. Half my brain tied behind my back in front of any college, college or university. You, I don't have time for written, written debates. Uh, there's a, one website coming up later. Kent Hovind refuses to debate. Yeah, they want to get me into an email debate where six people are listening. Yeah. <laughs> I got, 
how retarded is I don't that? have time. You know, yeah. I, I told one guy today, he said, why don't you, why don't you answer these critics? Why don't you, this one guy offered to do a written debate. I said, okay, why don't you call George Bush and offer to debate him on any topic? What would he say? <laughs> He's going to say no. He don't have time. Okay. Exactly. Now, I'm not George Bush, but I'm doing, fighting a much, much bigger battle. I don't have time. Exactly. To pick on one of these guys that has, you know. Now, he gives several websites here to people that have, uh, that have tried to pick up the quarter million dollar offer. Is that something that, uh, do you know many of these people or what, what's going on? No, them? I'm sure we'll get to them because they come up later, you know. Oh, okay. But yeah, I remember a couple of them. Uh, uh, Boudicca, we could spend all day on the uh, Boudicca. Yeah, we'll get into Boudicca 300 lies later. Okay, I want to go to item number four. On go back to his homepage, and we're going to do number four, assault and battery. I've never had a chance to publicly defend myself. Right, here we go. Here we go. And you can read through the whole thing about yourself. Uh, let me um, give you the, the, the story, okay? Maury Atkins worked for me uh, for quite a while in our ministry, doing a great job, a good friend of mine. Uh, he is very sick, and we need to pray for his health. He's moved on, I don't know, Oklahoma or someplace now, but he's uh, uh, in very bad health, so we're praying for Maury. Anyway, Maury got married uh, late in life, and the lady that he married already had a grown son who had a wife and, and baby, and we own a house next door. We were leasing a house next door to our ministry, right over that way, about 100 yards. My daughter and her husband live in it now. And Maury was there. He got married. Of course, his wife moved in with him. And then he came a couple weeks later and said, hey, my, my wife's uh, grown son doesn't have a job, and I would like to come down and live here. So we arranged to get the trailer over there. Jonathan, where are you living in that trailer? Uh, they were going to come live in there. Air conditioner was broke. It was hot. So we said, here, you stay there for a couple weeks until we get the trailer fixed. We got the trailer fixed. They never did move in. Ended up staying there in that little two-bedroom house, all five of them, yeah. four, seven of them. Long time. Uh, under the five. Two girls. And two, uh, seven, yeah, and two seven. girls, that's right. Anyway, bottom line is, she went schizo and threw Maury out of the house. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, family, they broke up. Okay. Um, Maury called me from someplace, Tallahassee or something, said, Brother Hovind, I just talked to Trudy. She would like me to give her some money so she can move. I said, okay. I went downtown. I would drove all over around where the, the Christian school where her two kids were going, the five and eight-year-old, whatever they were. I found a bunch of houses, came back with a list of houses that they could get, a list of realtors who would be glad to help. I talked to the school principal, said he was trying to help this family. I walked over there with $500 and this list on my clipboard of people that would like to get, you know, rent them a house. I said, uh, Trudy, Maury would like a, uh, for you to resign a receipt. I'm standing there half in the door, and uh, she said, I'm not signing a receipt. I said, Trudy, we got a problem here. You know, this is my house. It rented to Maury. You know, you threw the renter out. Uh, I mean, you have a problem, Trudy, and I'm trying to help. I'm your friend. I want to be your friend. Yeah. She said, you're not my friend. I said, look, I'm your friend. I've never hurt you in any way. Your kids love coming over here. We've been friends for a couple months here now. Let's get this straight. Bottom line is, uh, her 320-some pound son <laughs> came. Uh, when she tried to slam the door on me, I pushed the door back. I said, Trudy, wait a minute. Let's get this resolved. Uh, okay, hold it. we got to get this fixed. How can I help? Her 300-pound son came running across the kitchen uh, and grabbed me, th dragged me across the porch, which is about 8 or 10 feet wide, threw me down the steps, broke my rib, and cut my thigh. I, days, laid there on the front yard, and uh, I called Maury. Hey, Maury, uh, it didn't work. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I tried to give him some money. She didn't want the money. She, well, she wanted the money. She didn't want to sign a receipt. What do I do? He said, call the police. Get that guy arrested. He said, they've been in trouble before with the police. I said, okay. I called the police. Meanwhile... They called the police. Now, Scambia County has kind of an unwritten rule. If there's a domestic disturbance, whoever calls first is probably innocent. So their call beat me to the police station. I came back over here, got to work, you know, forgot about it, forget about it, but I came over here and did other things for a half hour. When I finally saw the police arrive over there, I was finished a couple phone calls I was on. I went over there to say, okay, that's the guy right there, the big guy sitting on the steps, you know, he threw me down the steps, broke my, you know, hurt my side, trying to lay my rib was broken, uh, arrest him. Didn't, police didn't want to hear a thing I had to say. Oh, not at all. <laughs> they had me handcuffed and ready to spray me with mace and, th and threw me in the back of the car. <laughs> if I didn't, he didn't want to hear a thing I had to say. And he, was, he had a mace can out. I said, what are you doing? I, I'm the innocent victim here. I didn't, do, I didn't touch anybody. It didn't matter. Threw me in the back of the car. Okay, here I'm in the back of this sweltering police car in July, you know. No, uh, uh, got the big glass screen in front of me with a little tiny window, you know. A little bit of air conditioning coming through that I'm leaning down oh. trying to survive. <laughs> Sweat rolling off me. I hollered at uh, Brent, uh, at uh, 
I saw I saw the policeman putting you in handcuffs. Yeah. So I ran over there. You ran over. Said, my wife ran over. Marlissa ran over. Paul came over. Anyway, what's going on? Bottom line is, the whole case was dropped. There was never any evidence. I didn't assault and batter anybody, okay? And you wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, you've been in my care I, for a long time. Yeah, I've, I've, done, enough, you a few I've times. done enough things that uh, <laughs> yeah. would warrant assault and battery, okay. but uh, I've okay. never gotten that. Sure. So, uh, Carl, this whole section needs to be removed from your sight. You're either confused about the facts or you're deliberately lying, okay? Yeah. Plus, it's a straw man. This is unrelated to the creation evolution issue. Even if I was guilty of assault and battery, which I'm not, it wouldn't matter. Right. It's an ad hominem attack. It's it? an ad hominem attack. Okay. That's the first sign you're losing a debate, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. You so, don't want to do that. I wrote, uh, uh, I had a friend of mine, had cost me $3,500 to defend myself <coughs> with a, a lawyer friend of mine, uh, to, be, uh, to defend myself against a false charge. When it came time for court, we walked into court, and the uh, prosecuting attorney just walks up and says, no prows, whatever that means in Latin. We're not going to prosecute. Yeah. Now so, that they've made you spend Now that they waste a bunch of my money and time and embarrassment, articles all over the paper and articles yeah. all over the internet over something that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So remove it. It's unnecessary. It's this, like I said, it's either you're confused about the facts or you're lying, okay? Because it, it didn't assault and batter anybody. Keep in mind, Jesus got accused of all kinds of things. Actually, he got accused and convicted and sentenced and executed over something he didn't do. So just because somebody gets accused of something, it doesn't mean a thing, okay? Wait and see what the final verdict is. The final verdict was, and you can look it up for yourself on the internet, on the police report, was there was no prosecution. I was never found guilty of assault and battery. And I'm telling you, I was not guilty of assault and battery. Yeah, and I can vouch for that. There's no way he would have uh, would have done that. And uh, knowing the situation of what happened, uh, Trudy is a little bit uh, psycho, and I'm wondering exactly what was going on there. Definitely Correct. got some issues that need to be... Removed. You can ask my wife, who I've been married to for 30 years. I've never hit her one time. I have thought about it a few times, okay? <laughs> I confess. She's probably thought about it with me a few times, okay? Definitely. Show me a married couple 30 years that hasn't thought about it, okay? Yeah. But I haven't even hit my own wife, okay? So I'm not going to batter, batter the neighbor's wife, that's exactly. for sure. God okay. designed a great little place for uh, for the kids to get whipped on, and uh, that's according to biblical principles. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and in the end, he should not depart from it. Yes. And I can tell you, oh, he knows where that place is. Plus, Dad played tennis in high school. Oh, forehand smack. Man, let me tell you, you do not want one of his spankings, Plus, okay? you now have a one-and-a-quarter-year-old. Oh, boy, yeah. My little girl, sowed. Stephanie. I am She's worried wonderful. about that. I'm, I'm definitely going to reap what I sow, and that's scary. Nah, that's wow. wonderful, son. Just uh, love him. I got what was my record in one day? About 20? No, we won't go there. But, okay. anyway. but I wanted you to turn out right, I think. <laughs> for the most part. You, know. well, you obeyed the Bible. So you I'm, did. I'm for that. Okay, I'm going to section four on his website, Analysis of Kent Hovind, the Mr. Hovind and the Professor. I haven't read this one yet. Uh, lies in the textbook sermon. Let's see. This is when you tell a story about the professor you spoke to on the airplane. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, great little story. If you haven't heard it, uh, seminar number one is the uh, professor's story concerning the Big Bang and how the professor didn't have the answers to the to the questions. That we okay, had. Mary Church is griping here that it's anonymous uh, authority. Who's the professor? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. How many people do I meet a week? Ooh, quite a few. I've flown 208 times this year. Um I don't remember who the professor was. It Bottom line matter. is, it, it doesn't matter. matter. What, yeah. what difference would this make? Okay. He's trying to make uh, a point. Uh, he's not out is, of the ball uh, here. He's calling, doing what's called filibuster. You know, let's, uh, let's, let's talk a whole bunch and distract people from the real story. The story is true. The professor did say he believed in the Big Bang. I can find you a hundred other professors who will say the same thing if you'd like, exactly. Carl. I mean, go visit a university. They'll tell you the same thing. They do believe in the Big Bang. And I, we did ask him about stuff, you know, uh, uh, spinning backwards, and he didn't have an answer for that. And it, it is a valid, legitimate story. Very good story. Okay, and he says, who's the professor? What's his area of study? Cosmology or maybe economics? Berkeley has more than 130 academic departments. Uh, That's here. a whole other amazing thing is how, how very quickly the evolutionist will defend something. And as soon as, soon as they need a way out, they'll just say, That's not my area of expertise. You know, They'll talk about it with you, but oh. as, soon as, as soon as you trap them, well, uh, you'd have to go talk to Professor so and so about that. You know, I, that's, not my, yeah. that's not my field. I covered that on video uh, four. Evolution is a shell game. It know? really is. They got the three cups and the pea under them, you know, and they're moving around trying to keep. The evolutionist, the biologist thinks, well, the, the botanist has the evidence. The botanist thinks, oh, the geologist has the evidence. There's no pea under any of them. Uh, that's the green kind, okay, just to let you know. The green little round ones? Okay, yeah, okay. There is no evidence for evolution whatsoever. They're all thinking somebody else has it, and nobody has it. That's exactly okay, right. Okay, he says here, uh, I'm, I'm telling the story about the professor. So he says, belief, small b, as a concept of science is not the same as belief, big b, as a theological position. This is where you're wrong, Carl. 
you do have to believe theologically, you have to believe religiously that evolution happened. And I don't know why you're not seeing it, and many others don't see it either or don't want to admit it. But uh, however many do at the same time, many of you out there listening right now can can very easily see that evolution is a religious worldview, that it is not part of science. We looked up science in the dictionary yesterday. Evolution has nothing to do, at least the first five, have nothing whatsoever to do with science. They do not go by the scientific method. If you really want to call yourself a scientist, really want to go according to the scientific method, let's examine evolution closely. And it's very easy to see. It doesn't fit science or the scientific Where's method. the observation? They always say, well, you have to live for millions of years to see this. Well, then, you're, then you're admitting my point. We don't see it. They'll talk about the fossil record. That, is, is there really a fossil record? There is no fossil record. Yeah. There are a bunch of bones in the dirt. That's not a record, is it's it? not a record. There's yeah. a bunch of bones in the dirt. Okay. Now, they're interpreting that to be a fossil record, and then they base their theory on their interpretation and say, see, our theory is true because it matches our interpretation. Whoa, duh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk about a circular reason. Yeah. A couple of more here, and we'll take some calls here. Or a, 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 a yeah, we got, we got uh, two more, one more minute, two more minutes till a break, so we'll cover a little bit more here. Then the last 20 minutes we'll take. Okay, he's still referring to my story on the airplane that I covered in my seminar. And uh, I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? And the professor said, well, it came from the Big Bang. And Carl writes in, straw man, there were a lot of steps after that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're missing the point. Okay, we did come, I, I was uh, debating uh, Pigliucci. Yeah. Did you, that went up in yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee. And I kept asking him, you know, I showed him what the textbook says. Uh, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, developed a hard, rocky crust, you know, then it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. Basically, you, you show you that 50 that's, seconds yeah, ago, that's, that's the simplicity, simple that view of evolution. precisely what the book teaches, but they teach it over 30 pages, so the kid doesn't get this shortened version right. of it, because they might laugh at it. And we got the book right there, if you don't believe me. Uh, so, I kept asking Pigliucci, it teaches at UT Knoxville, uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville, I said, Dr. Pigliucci, do you believe you came from a rock? He avoided the question about, I don't know, five times, I think. Finally, he got angry. He said, would you quit asking that question? I said, I just want an answer. Just ignore time. I'm going to give you billions of years. Do you, do you think we came from a rock? He said, well, not directly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Join us I after the break, folks. we came from a rock. After the break. Stay with us. All right, folks. Welcome back to the final segment of the Creation Science Hour. We have, over the break, been going over some of the stuff that uh, Mr. Mary Church has to say on his website about me and decided probably a fourth grader could answer most of this, yeah. maybe a second grader, uh, some of it. So we're not going to waste a whole lot of time with all of this. But Many of you out there I know are seeking answers and, and have some questions for Dr. Hoven. We do want to have you guys call in this next segment. So we want to discuss one more thing on his website, and that is, does Dr. Hoven have a Ph.D.? Uh, so we'll discuss that here in just a second. If you want to call in here in just a minute, the toll-free number for the uh, continental United States is 877-479-3466. If you have AOL Instant Messenger, feel free to instant message your questions or comments to DRDINO, Dr. Dino Live. DRDINO Live, L-I-V-E. All right, we'll take calls in a minute if there's time. We're going to hurry here. I get this a lot. A lot of the Antihoven websites are saying he doesn't have a legitimate Ph.D. Okay. Uh, PhD stands for uh, Doctor of Philosophy. Okay, you can get a PhD in lots of different things. You can get a PhD in, in any number of subjects. Okay, um, here's my, and I have all this written out on my website. You know, do you have a legitimate PhD? Now, why uh, Mary Church has this on here, I don't know. It's answered again, thoroughly on the website. Again, it's an ad hominem attack. Right. Again. Uh, wouldn't matter if I had a degree. Wouldn't matter at all. Okay, but I do. Okay, I have a legitimate PhD. Uh, and then he's got a link on here to uh, uh, Karen Bartelt, uh, PhD her article about the dissertation Ken Hovind doesn't want you to read. Uh, I debated Karen Bartelt on the radio uh, years ago in Morton, Illinois, and then she agreed. She teaches at uh, Eureka College in uh, Eureka, Illinois, not far from where I was brought up, and she teaches uh, evolutionary biology or something like that. Okay, so I, I had a continuous standing offer to debate her any time because she had written all kinds of things about the, on the Internet about me, and she still has stuff on the Internet about me, Karen Bartelt. So finally I debated her at the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria, Illinois, and what debate number is that? Do you remember, Jonathan? It's either uh, eight or nine, maybe? Seven, six, seven, eight, nine. It's on my seven, website. Nine, yeah. Go to our debate. It's one of the debates I did with Karen. And you can see for yourself why she's probably not going to debate me again. Now, Karen, if you're listening, I'll be glad to debate you anytime. Okay? My brother lives there in Peoria. I'll fly at my expense and debate you in front of your university. You and any number of professors you can get to back you up. Okay? Exactly. One against 20 on two conditions. I get half the time, and we talk about one topic at a time. Okay. If so, you do watch that debate, or if you've seen it, if you're listening and you've seen it, you know that was a uh, 
easily to say that was a slaughterhouse. Man, well, that her was whole a, thing was ad hominem attacks, attacking yeah. me personally. I want to stick with the subject, okay? It I don't mind the personal thing. attacks. I can handle it. We're doing something here. But uh, I love it because, uh, Dad, you went through and you just said, uh, when she got done with all of these attacks, you said, okay, throw the PhD out the window, throw everything you want at me. I'm a bad person if you want. Okay, now. What about creation versus evolution? Right. <laughs> Let's get, get to the subject at hand. Kent, call me Bubba, call me Hey You. Now, you know. <laughs> okay. I do have a PhD from Patriot University, which is a small, non accredited Christian university in Colorado. It was at Hilltop Baptist Church. Their number is 719 597 7512. You can contact them and ask them if this story is true. About three people a year got a PhD through Patriot University, got a doctor's degree of some kind. About 25 people a year got lower degrees, bachelor's or doctor. They offer distance learning, which thousands of universities do, okay? You can get many degrees from universities all over the world. I was up at Rutgers University, and I went and saw their department for, to get a degree in, I forget what it was, you know, some, some subject. It was, a, it was a closet converted to a desk and a person, and this is where they handle the correspondence from people doing their correspondence to get a degree. Yeah, you don't need anything major when it's only correspondence. Right. So. Now, uh, so I mentioned that my PhD is from Patriot. Patriot, then after I got my PhD years later, moved to a different church. It's a Christian university out in the hills of Colorado someplace. And right next to the church is a parsonage. Well, somebody went by and took a picture of the parsonage, which has the same address. Oh, Dan, you have the PhD. Another yes, P we do have an official PhD here. There we go. I'd like to show that to everybody. You're going to have to get this video uh, if you'd like to see it. Here is the official PhD. We were Dad using holding it right now. The post hole digger. Post hole digger. We got one day. right here. <laughs> just using it. So uh, okay, we good. got two of these actually, plus uh, the the uh, the doctor of philosophy. That makes a total of three. So that's that's yeah, great. I do have a legitimate PhD. So if you don't like it, don't call me. Call me doctor. Call me Bubba. It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Many people get degrees. I don't know if people cheat for their degrees or lie or somebody else pays for it. And I don't know. I know I worked hard for mine. If you don't like it, ignore it. Okay, Carl, this is unnecessary on your site. Okay, we got a caller here. Let's take the first one here. Go ahead. Yes, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, his, his question is, what about DNA manipula manipulation, which scientists are doing now, manipulating the DNA? and, and, and uh, Right. Is it good or bad? Or can they, There's no question they can do it. The question is, is it going to do any good? Uh, can we improve on what God made? And is, are there any dangers involved? You know, I think uh, they crossed, a, you know, took some genes from a firefly or something that glows and put it into a monkey, you know, and made a glow-in-the-dark monkey or something. <laughs> oh, well, that's real handy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the hawk is going through the jungle in the middle of the night. You know, where's that monkey? Oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> it's not it's anything going to increase survival value. Uh, I am very nervous. I don't think man knows near enough about the genetic code to be messing with it like that, okay? Uh, I think, you know, it's going to be one of those cases where they create a monster that is now, you know, uh, they can create a new bacteria for which there is no antidote, you know. Uh, yeah. They're going to create a plague. Uh, could happen. I'm not against this kind of research. I'm just, I'm just saying I think modern man is, is in first grade or kindergarten compared to where we need to be in our understanding of the DNA, the most complex molecule in the universe. We're nowhere close to being able to, uh, to, 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 mess to, with this, to mess with uh, this. Another whole way to look at it is some people are going to say, well, they've rearranged this DNA. Doesn't that prove evolution? Look what they've made now. Uh, would that prove evolution? Well, what they've done, they've got things like the giant strawberries, you know. It's called yeah. polyploidy. It's a doubling of the information. There's no new information. Exactly. Same number of chromosomes doubled, okay? I have one more point I want to make about the degree, though. Uh, Charles Darwin's degree was in th uh, theology. Textbooks call him a scientist. His only degree was in theology. Uh, many of the people involved in the early days with evolution uh, were, had nothing to do with science. For instance, uh, Charles Darwin was an apostate divinity student. Charles Lyell was a lawyer. Uh, William Smith was a surveyor, James Hutton was an agriculturist, John Playfair was a mathematician, Robert Chambers was a journalist, Russell Wallace had little formal education of any kind, except a little apprentice in surveying. Thomas Huxley had an indifferent education in, in medicine. Herbert Spencer received practically no formal education except some practical experience in railroad engineering. Thomas Malthus was a theologian and an economist. Uh, Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor and a poet. Uh, all these guys are the big big names in evolution back in the early 1800s. Uh, so you don't have to have a doctor's degree in anything. Um, 
So I do cover that on my website. Would appreciate appreciate the answer, but Carl, I, I would say you need to take that off your site. Got a couple of uh, AOL instant messages here. This is from Doug in New York. Hey, Doug. Uh, his roommate Dave is with him. So hey, Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, he says he's got a question in the book of Job. God spoke to Job asking, where were you when the stars sang to the earth? And also in Psalms, where another verse uh, about stars singing. Do you think at one time the firmament was able to pick up frequencies and resonate them to make the beautiful sounds God spoke of? I do, but I couldn't prove it. Uh, it does talk in those, ver those passages about uh, the stars singing together. Uh, Carl Baugh probably has the best research I've seen on that. On the, he thinks the canopy that used to protect the earth, mentioned in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, and mentioned in uh, uh, 2 Peter 3, about the water, the earth was in the water and out of the water. I suspect, and Carl Baugh thinks, uh, it's probably a canopy of ice, 10 or 20 inches, I don't know, whatever it takes, act as a barrier, a greenhouse effect, to filter out the radiation, increase air pressure. He says it was probably uh, super frozen hydrogen, oxygen, because uh, hydrogen and oxygen molecules, 105 degree angle like Mickey Mouse ears on the uh, oxygen molecule, the two hydrogens, when it freezes, it, it locks itself into a, a matrix that is, uh, expands 12%. This 12% expansion is why ice floats instead of sinks. You goofing off over there, son? Yeah, I've just uh, got a call there. No, got a meeting later. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, the, uh, as you keep getting it colder and colder, however, it starts to recrystallize again and reform, a, apparently a new substance, uh, it's still ice, but it's super cold ice, and he's, Carl Ball says, it, it laminates into hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, and now it becomes malleable, where you can hit it with a hammer and it won't shatter, instead it flattens out like lead or gold. We're talking like super cold temperatures, 400 below zero Fahrenheit, uh, you know, even down close to absolute zero, 459.6 for you technical folks, or you know, negative 273 Kelvin, uh, Celsius, or zero degrees Kelvin. So. Um, or there's another fourth temperature scale, but I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, the fact is, at low temperatures, ice behaves strangely, and it may indeed have resonated or uh, uh, changed the radio waves. No question, stars put off radio signals. There are yeah. radio telescopes to listen to that. Is that a frequency though that we can hear? Bottom line is, we don't know. Well, you can't hear the frequency coming from the radio station now, right. unless you get a tuner to adjust it. You know, you yeah. can get a radio. So it change. could have worked. It could not have. We don't know. It had the radio changes a, a electromagnetic frequency into something you can hear, an audio frequency. So I don't know. I think so though. Lord has risen, 2003. Can you please explain? This is that's who that's from. Can you please explain where the idea for a pre-Adamic uh, Adamic race? came from, and why do many preachers still go along with the gap theory, even though it does not hold water to the Word of God? The theory came from the devil, who wants people to believe the Bible is not literally true. Yeah. He wants us to think there was death before Adam got here. The Bible says clearly in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Romans 5, man brought death into the world. The pre-Adamic race idea says there were people here before Adam, they died when Satan fell from heaven. The whole theory is baloney. We cover that in great detail on uh, videotape number two or on a little book that we wrote called The Gap Theory. Yep. Uh, this is, let's see. Here, <laughs> whatever that is. Uh, some of them have really hard names to pronounce. Yeah, no, I, sure. yeah. okay. I wonder where some of these people came up with these screen names. This is crazy. Uh, if it is true that the moon was around a million years ago, the distance difference would be irrelevant. That's what he writes in. See if you can make sense of that. If it is true... By the way, the while, while my dad's checking that out, if you got an AOL Instant Messenger, we got about, uh, or you want to call, we got about three or four minutes, or three minutes remaining. Uh, feel free to call at 877-479-3466. If uh, you would like to AOL Instant Message us, it's Dr. Dino Live is the screen name. Okay. Uh, this fellow says, uh, whoever, hero of time, if, the moon was, if it is true that the moon was around a million years ago, the distance... Difference would be irrelevant. Oh, uh, not true. See, the moon is leaving us about three inches a year. Yeah. So if you go back a million years, it was closer. Probably not enough to make a big difference. You go back a billion years, ooh, now you got a problem. Yeah. Now, we don't know if it's logarithmic or geometric or lineal, the progression as it leaves, but probably geometric. Bottom line is, it is leaving, isn't it? It is leaving, which means yeah. it used to be closer. Closer. You bring the moon in closer, you get a problem because the moon causes the tides. tides. Okay. We're in Pensacola, six miles from the beach. You know, here you worry about the tides. If hurricanes hit during high tide, Got a problem. Yeah. Hurricanes hit anytime, you got a problem, but you get a worse <laughs> problem if it's high tide. So bringing the moon in closer makes the tides higher, which creates a real problem. It's going to wash the beach clear back to Chicago. Walt Brown says on his website, creationscience.com, there's a 1.2 billion year time limit for the Earth moon situation just because the moon is moving away. So, in answer to your question, hero of time, uh, I agree, a million years probably wouldn't make much difference. A billion would, and the textbook says, up here, I got a bunch of them, that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And the moon's 4.6. Scientifically, impossible. 
yeah. can't be true. They're lying to you. No, well, yeah, I mean, okay. if you go back 1.2 billion years, the tides would cause everything on Earth to drown, everything on Earth to drown twice a day. Normally, most people can only drown once a day. Once a day, yeah. That's, yeah, that's usually that's the, the limit. That's the limit. Okay. Tomorrow, we're going to be dealing with more of the website. Uh, what we're going to do for sake of time, so I'm going to try to get some time tomorrow and synthesize. Just pick a few of the key questions off of Carl Mary Church, uh, his website, uh, geocities.com slash Kent Hoven. He's got stuff about Patriot University, quacky quotes, show me the money, liar, liar, pants on fire. I'll go through and try to pick out a few of the ones that are worth dealing with. Some are <laughs> simply not worth dealing Absolutely with. Silly. Sorry, Carl. Uh, so, Carl, we've, you've been invited to call in or write into the show. If any of you folks want to go through some of these Antihoven websites and pick out some of the key things that really bother you, AOL Instant Message us to uh, Dr. Dino Live, our screen name, or go to drdino.com and go to the Creation Science Hour, and you can AOL Instant Message that way. I've never sent an AOL Instant Message and don't know how to do it. Wouldn't so, know how either. <laughs> most important part of the program, though, is letting folks know Jesus loves you, yeah. even you folks that believe in evolution. Even though you're calling God a liar, he still loves you. Still willing to forgive you, okay? Um, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Actually, I've committed the worst sin in the world. Yeah. The Bible says you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus said that's the first and great commandment. Um, I haven't always done that. So to break the greatest commandment would be the greatest sin. Yeah, it would. I've broken it. And so, so you may I... have done something, you know, minor like, you know, murder or... Um, <laughs> something like that. Adultery, fornication, yeah. you name it. I've, I've done a lot worse than that, and Jesus forgave me, and he'll forgive you. He loves you. He wants to forgive you and save you. 35 years ago, in February, it'd be my 35th anniversary as a Christian, I gave my heart to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me and save me? And he did. And uh, you did that years ago. Ask the Lord to forgive you, and that's what God wants from you, too. Exactly. He wants you to ask him to forgive you and save you. It's wonderful. So go to our website, how to get saved, drdino.com. Tune in tomorrow, folks. Join us then.